What's going on everyone? In this video, we're jumping into some of the latest and greatest Keyshot 25.3 has to offer. We'll get started by jumping into a Keyshot workflow that incorporates some of these new updates as well as a few other additions from recent releases. Then we'll wrap things up at the end with a few more improvements and additions that we'd like to call attention to. So let's dive into building this scene out. We're starting from a point where our CAD data has already been imported and staged, and now we need to start materializing our scene. One of the latest updates in Keyshot Studio is open PBR support, which means users can now transfer and import files through the Rhino and Blender plugins, as well as import GLTF and GLB files directly through the importer while maintaining the original material parameters. In this case, we are going to directly import our files and use some fantastic materials from Polyhaven to build out the stone and fabric surfaces under our bottle. As you can see here, we're doing a quick search for a material that might work. This one looks like it serves the purpose we're looking for, We'll go ahead and hit download after selecting the GLTF material type and save it to our computer. From here, we can import the GLTF file directly into Keyshot, and you'll notice that when it is imported, the geometry comes in with the original PBR material applied. There are several ways to apply the PBR material to the stone base. However, in this case, we are simply going to shift click the material, and then while holding shift, right click the object you want to apply it to. Looks decent enough, but let's look for another material that might work better. We'll grab the new material, import it in the same manner, and then apply the PBR material in the same way we did the last. Looks pretty good. We're just going to make some quick material adjustments to this by scaling the UVs, and then we'll jump back over to Polyhaven and find a material for the cloth. Again, We'll download the imported material, and then we'll apply it to our scene. It does work, but we can find something better. We'll find another material. Once again, download and import the GLTF, and then apply it to the scene. This looks much better. At this point, we can just go through and adjust the material to look a little bit more realistic. As with any PBR material, you have a significant amount of control over how the material looks in Keyshot. We'll finalize some parameters and then begin applying materials to our bottle before working on the label. Now that we have the majority of our scene's material squared away, let's use the recently introduced AI Shots tool to mock up a quick placeholder label for our bottle. We'll open up the AI Shots tool, and if you're familiar with our prior release of AI Shots, you may notice that the UI has changed a bit. You can see that when opened, previous AI Shots generations are now saved under the AI Shots panel. From here, we'll select the new AI Shot button near the bottom of the panel to open the prompt field and parameters. Once open, the goal is to use AI Shots to generate an image that specifically fits the white space allocated for a label on the bottle. For this workflow, we'll make sure that we are using Imagine to generate the image, and we'll start by adjusting the resolution parameters and then create a prompt that will be used to generate the label. Note that the prompt being used here is pretty rough and meant to be a quick example. However, Keyshot's AI reacts particularly well to specificity and highly descriptive prompts. Once filled out, we'll hit generate and allow the tool to generate a few different images for us to choose from. Be aware that the video has been sped up for the sake of this demo, but the speed at which you generate your images will be entirely dependent on the hardware you're using. In this case, we didn't quite get an image we're happy with, so let's refine the prompt a bit and give it another go. Okay, looks like we have something usable. Again, remember this is just a quick mock-up so that the label has some level of detail. We'll go ahead and save the image out and then apply it as a base color for the label material. From here, we'll adjust the image by scaling, rotating, and adjusting the mapping type until we get a decent fit on the model. There are obviously many ways in which AI shots can be used. Commonly, we see everything from color and material way ideation to background image generation and scene staging. But this is just one of many creative and novel ways that we can integrate AI shots into our Keyshot workflows to help simplify the creative process. Now that we've spent some time setting up our scene, let's take a quick look at the material graph and some of its updates in 25.3. We're going to jump in and use the updated UI to change the color of our cloth material in our scene. But first, let's go over what's new. 
The first change I want to call attention to is the material graph view. Notice that by grabbing the material graph workspace, the view is now unlocked and we can quickly and freely move the material graph around the screen to access the nodes in their entirety. We can now also zoom in specifically to the cursor location for more precise navigation. Under the View tab, we also have two new options, Show Grid and Snap to Grid. These let you adjust and organize nodes in the material graph a little bit more easily. And lastly, we've gained the ability to dock the material graph window within the program's UI and adjust it to size as needed. Some very helpful updates for those of us who like to work in the material graph regularly. With that covered, let's jump in here and get back to adjusting the material color. We're going to go ahead and click the connection line between the texture map and base color and hit Q to open up the quick search. We'll then search for a color adjust node and apply that between the two points. Not a new feature, but very helpful for adjusting texture map colors. With the color adjust node applied, we can easily manipulate the parameters to change the color or saturate and desaturate the image. In this case, just as a demonstration, we'll adjust the hue slider until we hit a color we like, and then we'll work with that. We're about to take a look at the new custom pivot point feature, but to make it easier to work with in relation to the pump assembly, we're going to go ahead and group the different components together. We'll start by control clicking each individual component to select them together. This is not a new function. What is new in 25.3 is the ability to use the hotkeys control G to quickly group these components in the scene tree, which you can see being done now. You can see the group just popped up in the scene tree. Now we can control shift plus click to select the entire model and its components, or we can control shift plus double click to select the specific group we just created. Now that we set up the pump assembly as a group, let's use the new custom pivot feature to adjust the pivot point. As a demonstration, you can see that when the group is selected and the move tool is open, and we try and rotate the part along the Z axis, it does not rotate around the central point of the bottle's opening correctly. We can try it in origin mode as well and see that it still does not rotate correctly. To fix this, we're going to use custom pivot. We'll select the cylinder option and click two points on the bottle's neck, which we're trying to center the pivot point to and hit done. Then we'll go back to the move tool. Now you can see that when we rotate along the Z axis, the center point is now correctly fixed concentric to the opening of the bottle. This is just one way of implementing the new custom pivot to help make staging scenes and animations that much easier. This new tool just lends to greater flexibility and freedom from defined pivot points coming from your preferred CAD applications, particularly when origin points and pivot points may have been off during the modeling of a given piece of geometry. In this example, we use cylinder mode, but we also have two other modes, including corner mode, where you can set a pivot point on a corner where planes intersect, and sphere mode, which allows you to place a pivot point in the center of a sphere. This is particularly helpful when you're creating pivot points for ball joints. Up until this point, we've just been working with the default environment lighting, but let's turn the environment's brightness down and create a more customized lighting setup. We'll use the add light button along the ribbon at the top, which we introduced in our last release. From here, we can select any of our physical lights. In this case, we'll select the planar light and quickly apply it as a highlight by clicking on the model with the highlight mode selected. We'll then use control shift wheel to quickly adjust the light's power. You can see the hotkeys being called out in the blue box at the top of the real time view. If we aren't happy with the light placement, using the highlight mode, we can just click around the model to automatically place the light source in a location that projects that highlight. However, we have added a new function to orbit mode in 25.3. As a recap, orbit mode allows us to orbit the light source around a target by hitting control and moving the mouse simultaneously. What's new in this release is the ability to lock the orbit axis by hitting shift simultaneously, which you can see on screen now. We'll duplicate the light again. We'll use the orbit tool in the new lock axis function to rotate the new light into a position on the opposite side of the model. At this point, we can make some adjustments and add a couple more lights to the scene to fine tune the way our models appear and bring attention to both the label we're using and the shape of the pump assembly on top of the model. With the scene lit, it's time to fine tune the lighting using a new addition from our last release, light layers. Essentially, we're gonna use the light layer tool to mask our lights in a way that calls attention to or emphasizes particular elements within the scene. To get started, we'll add a new light layer, which will be our bottle layer, while the default layer will encompass the entire scene. 
For the default layer, we'll make sure that some of the larger lights meant to fill in information on the bottle are turned off. We can click through the lights within the default layer and determine which light will serve us best. Once selected, we'll fine tune the light settings a little bit more. In this case, we'll adjust the color temperature to create a more dynamic lighting effect, and we'll also adjust the individual light's power if necessary to get a better one, two, three read on our scene's objects. In this case, we wanna also make sure the label has some attention called to it while still maintaining a realistically lit appearance. At this point, it appears the pump is getting a little lost in the background. We'll add another light and adjust it to achieve the effect we're looking for. You'll also notice that the newly added light has been populated within the lights list in the light layers window. Since it's a new light, we can continue fine tuning and adjusting the settings, but we'll speed that up for the sake of not spending too much time on this step. Now with that situated, we'll make a new layer called pump and select the newly added light along with any others we want to use to highlight that specific piece of geometry. Just make sure that each piece of geometry has the correct light layers assigned to it. As you can see here, we needed to double check and switch the assigned light layers to remove the reflection on the bottle that was intended to be projected on the pump only. Now that we have the scene set and our lighting situated, let's add a little touch of photorealism using the depth of field settings under our camera tab. Depth of field is common in product photography and by replicating its effect in Keyshot, we can easily give the appearance of a physical model that was photographed instead of rendered. As a Keyshot user, most of us are accustomed to using depth of field in finalized images. However, one of the main pain points we regularly encountered was having to adjust our focal point every time we zoom in and out of a scene. Often, it was just easier to work without depth of field until the scene was finalized and our camera positions were set. Well, in 25.3, that is no longer an issue. We've officially introduced a depth of field lock using the Keep Focus toggle under the depth of field settings. With Keep Focus toggled on, we've locked our depth of field to that specific point in space and can now zoom in and out and move the camera around without losing our focal point, as you can see on screen. In this case, our fall off is pretty strong. We'll go ahead and adjust our f-stop to reduce the effect and get something that looks a touch more realistic. And to wrap things up with this workflow, we'll jump back into the AI Shots tool to create a backdrop for our scene. We'll reopen AI Shots and go to New AI Shot and select the background option. Then adjust our camera to a position we like along with any lens settings we'd like to change as well. Once we're happy with the composition, we can write a descriptive prompt to generate some background options for our scene. Again, this portion is sped up for demonstration purposes, but the speed at which images are generated is entirely dependent on hardware. Once generated, we can then select one of the images and save it out for later use or drag and drop it into the background to use as a backplate image. We'll then resize the background images so that the scene overlays nicely and looks natural. And that's it. A quick look at a full workflow that incorporates some of the latest and greatest that Keyshot Studio has to offer. As promised, I did want to spend a moment to call out a few more improvements that were not included in the previous workflow. The first up is improved displacement times. Keyshot 25.3 has received some backend updates that significantly decrease the time it takes to calculate displacements and changes to displace parameters. On screen is an example of dot three on the left and dot two on the right. Dot three is significantly faster and completes in just one and a half seconds. While dot two takes a full 10 seconds to complete, meaning that in this case, we're seeing an 85% speed increase between versions. Another update is the introduction of CryptoMat support. Nearly all rendering, whether it's still imagery or animations, requires post-production touch-ups. Often it requires a level of accuracy to isolate specific elements within an image or frame to correctly post-process without discrepancy. With the introduction of CryptoMat support in Keyshot, we can now select CryptoMat from the Layers and Passes section of our render window and render out projects with those outputs included, which in this case is an animation. Once rendered out, we can open our animations frames and find both the frame images and EXR CryptoMat outputs. For this demo, we'll open the outputs in After Effects, but these files can be used in any CryptoMat supported post-processing program. First, we'll import the regular frames in as a new composition and then import the CryptoMat frames and then add them to our composition as well. Check to make sure everything looks good 
Then apply the crypto mat effect to the corresponding clip and the end result will be a color preview similar to a clown pass. To isolate specific elements, we'll change the output from colors to matted colors. Then we can select the specific elements we want to mask for. In this case, we'll select the copper screws. You can now see that the selection we just made is not limited to just the frame we made the selection on, but all frames in the animation. Then we can simply set the track matte layer for the animation to the crypto matte layer, and you can see that the screws are immediately masked out and isolated in the preview. Doing this without crypto matte is incredibly time consuming and difficult to do, especially since the animation was rendered out with both depth of field and motion blur, which makes selecting pixels accurately even more difficult. We'll just duplicate the regular animation layer quickly so we can see the rest of the image, and then we can zoom in and make adjustments to the isolated parts of our animation, which you can see happening on screen now. CryptoMat is exceptionally helpful for individuals who spend large amounts of time post-processing both images and animations, and with CryptoMat support and KeyShot, users can now simplify and significantly speed up their post-processing workflows. Another small but incredibly helpful update is to the Move Tool Gizmo as pictured on screen. You can see that the latest version of the Gizmo on the right has been updated to be even easier to interact with. Both larger arrows and more visible planar controls make it easier to see the Gizmo on screen and move elements around as needed. We've also introduced uniform scaling while holding the Shift key, and of course, the addition of custom pivot, which we went over earlier. And lastly, just a couple quick mentions, we've enhanced the triplanar shader to allow direct connection of procedural textures. This means that we can use procedurals without creating images in external programs and are able to make adjustments as needed since they are not baked into a texture. We've also introduced Rhino importer instancing, meaning that instancing is no longer just available in our plugin. The benefit of instancing is that Rhino users importing their files can keep file sizes down, which enables them to load and render much faster. Thanks for sticking around and don't forget to stay tuned for upcoming content on all our latest releases. Thanks everybody.